Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you for watching the channel. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, this channel is dedicated to the rational investor, the cash flow investor. We're not speculators. We are investors. We're people who want to buy or invest into companies that generate strong free cash flow and own them for a long, long time, which is the best way to benefit from the compounding effect of owning stock equities. Now, we look at a ch we look at stock every week at this channel. This week up, we're gonna take a look at Ferguson. Now, Ferguson, might, you might not have heard of this business, but it's a very big and growing multi-location business that operates as a supplier to plumbers, to electricians. They supply all the parts that are needed to do the upgrades to homes, to infrastructures, to businesses. And they have thousands of locations. They're growing their revenue, growing their earnings. Let's figure out if we bought the stock today, held it for 10 years, how much money we can make. You ready? Let's get to work. Okay, now we, before we value any stock, I always wanna remind people to read the annual reports, the 10Ks that come out for all publicly held stocks. They publish them annually. You definitely need to read them. Uh, behind me, what I'm gonna show you today is we're gonna go through their most recent quarterly results. 2023, their fiscal year, first quarter is out. We're gonna take a look at that. Then we're gonna look at nine years of historical financial information for this business. A lot has changed in this business. And if you use a standard stock screener, you would never have found this stock. The only way you find stocks like these is you dig. You do the reading, you do the research, you compile it, and then you sit back and reflect on it, which you're gonna find here is a very interesting story. So let's take a look at the Q1 quarterly results for Ferguson. Now, one more thing before we look at Ferguson, I want to remind everybody of exactly how we review a stock in this channel. We use five key attributes to very simply summarize the performance of a business, and that is the starting point for true due diligence before you make an investment. But what we look for are five key factors. Number one, top line revenue growth. We want to see revenue for the business must be growing over a long period of time. Number two, Earnings, we use enterprise level earnings. The metric we use is called EBITDA earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Number three, we wanna see strong free cash flow. Number four, we want low debt. Debt needs to be less than three times debt to EBITDA. And we want a well-priced stock. Now, what is a well-priced stock? A well-priced stock is a stock whose forecast, given a conservative forecast in the future, the return of that stock will beat the stock market. That's what we want. This S&P 500 in the United States be, uh, runs about 10% annually for any 10 year period of time. We are looking for stocks that outperform that. We wanna find a stock with a high probability of high performance. That's what we do. And we focus our portfolio around 20 to 30 stocks that we hold for a long, long time. Now, a long time is 10, 20, 30, 40 years, if you look at some of those books, there's a book called From 1 to 100. A lot of the stocks there that went up 100X, you'd have to own for 30 to 40 years, but it is possible. You just need to be very patient. Most of, That's the biggest thing that most investors lack is simply the will to hold on and do nothing. Let's take a look at Ferguson and see what this stock uh, qualifies for. All right, the very first page of their, of their quarterly earnings shows net sales growth quarter over quarter for the year. So Q123 versus Q122, up 16.6%. Strong top line revenue growth at the quarter basis. And then adjusted operating profit up 12.6% uh, year over year. Very, very strong result in this economy for sure. The next slide here gives you a breakdown of the of where their business uh, is derived from, where the percent of revenue comes from. And you can see 40, excuse me, 54% of their revenue comes from the residential market. The other 46 is, is non-residential, meaning mostly it's the commercial applications of plumbing and heating, uh, cooling, AC applications and supplies. Uh, the next slide breaks down where their customers uh, what kind of products their customers are using. So mostly residential trade, building and remodeling, and digital commerce uh, are roughly that 50%. The rest of it, HVAC is, is um, and that's, that's heating and air conditioning. So that's the big, the big unit that sits on top of your roof that makes all kinds of noise, that makes cool air. That's what this is. That is 13, excuse me, 11% of the revenue 
big industrial waterworks, those guys in the cities with the giant pipes that are you know two feet across, that they sell supplies into that market. That's 21% of their net sales revenue. And then rounding out the quarter here, I just want to touch on their, their, their earnings very quickly. We normally look at, at annual earnings, but it's nice to take a look at things on a quarterly basis. Net sales, roughly $8 billion on net sales, 30% gross margin, adjusted operating profit, $864 million at an 11% margin, pretty decent. They list an adjusted EBITDA here of $912 million for the quarter, and they give us a net debt to adjusted EBITDA, which is what we like to see. We want to, we want to see people or companies scale or, or measure their debt relative to earnings, and they're listing a one times debt to earnings ratio here for the quarter, which is really, really strong and, and very unlevered, and we like to see that. The last slide I'm gonna show you in this earnings, because we don't focus on quarterly earnings, I wanna to get to the annual numbers, especially historical and annual numbers. But I just wanna show, they, they do pay a dividend, annual increase in the dividend is 9% in this market, which is pretty strong. They do make a lot of acquisitions. Now they've acquired three acquisitions since August 1st. Uh, that's basically to, uh, $270 million of annualized revenue that they purchased. What are they buying? They're buying mom and pop uh, retail locations that they can use as distribution hubs for their, their parts and their supplies. So very interesting business model. Lots of possibility to continue to buy up customer bases by buying up these individual uh, hardware stores, essentially, but that only focus in the plumbing and HVAC section. All right, let's get, take, take a look at the annual numbers and start building a forecast. All right, now what we're going to do is we want to look at their annual numbers. We want to look at annual numbers over a long period of time. That's the best way to A, smooth out any accounting regularities. It's much more difficult for uh, CFOs and, and, and executives to hide or bury or misconstrue um, business results in the numbers over a long, long period of time. Now, I personally, I'm a CFO. That's my trade. I do this channel for fun to teach people how to value stocks. Uh, and I will tell you that while you can move numbers around to hit a quarterly earnings target, it's very, very hard to continuously do that over, over time. And that's one of the reasons I want to look at a stock over 10 years. You get a much better sense of how the business is performing, uh, ideally through economic cycles, um, by looking at long, long period of times, especially if you're going to own the stock for, again, 20, 30 years. You can't look at one quarter's performance and hold the, co hold the company for that long. So... We really want to look for a long period of time. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you nine years of historical data on, uh, on Ferguson. And let's take a look and see how much revenue this company generates. So behind me, I've got their financials. Their fiscal year ends July, uh, July 31st. So this is 2014's year ending July 31st and back, 12 months. And then it goes all the way to, to uh, July 2022, just completed, or rather it was completed this, this year, uh, that's why the Q1 2023 is available. So top line revenue, re revenue $20 billion to almost $21 billion in 2014. And that is actually flat, which is surprising, a flat to declining uh, year over year. So 2015, $20.8 billion, then it drops to 16.66, 19.2, 20.8. Uh, 19.7, 19.9, and then finally, it starts growing again all the way in 2021. So that's a long period. That's about six years there of flat to declining revenue. And then it grows, 20, uh, uh, 2021 revenue was $22.8 billion, and then strong growth in 20, 2022 was $28.6 billion of top line revenue. So if I look over the totality of that, when I started at uh, 2014 at 20.8 and I grow to 28.6 by 2022, that's a 4% annualized growth rate over that period of time. Now it's definitely, definitely rocky and definitely weighted to the very front edge of that time frame. You had it's about six years of almost zero growth and then suddenly a spike in the COVID era. So you wanna figure out what's going on. I'll get to that in a second. Let's take a look at earnings. Earnings, earnings before, Interest tax depreciation, EBITDA is what we're gonna use. It's the enterprise level earnings and earnings are gonna follow roughly the same pattern. $1.4 billion of earnings in 2014. Then I'm gonna just go down to present day. 1.5 billion, 
So it's basically doubled in profitability in the last two years. Now, what the heck is going on? If you used a stock screener, and this is one reason I absolutely hate stock screeners, is they wipe over and generalize a lot of the financial performance. And unfortunately, everybody uses stock screeners. You have to slow down and you have to read the detail. Now, what's interesting here, and I only found this out, is when I was looking in the per unit uh, breakdown of the business. I'll show you this chart right here. Um, what's going on here is they're a global business and they have global locations in the UK. They have a large presence in the UK. They have a large presence in Europe, Canada, some of the rest of the world and the United States. And when we're looking historically back in 2014, as an example, they had a much bigger presence in, in Europe. They had 768 locations out of a total locations of 28, uh, to almost 2,900. So they had 2,900 locations in 2014, 768 of those were in the UK. So large UK presence. And then over time, they have elected, even though they technically are a UK-based company listed in the United States, they have elected to sell off and close their European locations and keep basically Canada and the United States. And so what happens over this period of time when they go from 768 locations in the UK to zero by 2021, what's going on is they're selling down their underperforming locations and they're growing their US portfolio. So if you look at US portfolio in the same time frame, 1,377 locations in 2014 when they had these uh, 768 in the UK. And that has grown to 1418, 1465, 1423, 1444, continue to grow all the way to present day of slightly over 1500 locations in the US. And that's what that's their plan. Their plan is to jettison and shut down and close or sell off all of the UK uh, and, and Europe locations, which they by and large have done. And they're focusing their capital investment in the United States. So now, when I, well, A, I'll graph this, so you can see just the totality of everything. What that means is that over the time frame that we have been looking at historically, the number of, the total number of locations that they have it actually fallen from just near 3,000 to just about halfway, uh, 1,800 or so to present day. So it's, it's, it's shed almost a thousand locations as they sold this stuff off. So now when I look at the profitability, when I look at the um, revenue and earnings, it kind of makes sense why revenue and earnings are flat is because they're selling off businesses that in their mind are underperforming and they're building the businesses that they want to be in in the United States. And the two of those basically even out to where revenue and earnings are flat for most of this decade period. And then when they're done in 2020, they sold off the rest of the UK. That's when there's no more um, removal of locations, but they're only growing. And suddenly after two years, in two years, they've doubled in profitability. Why? Because they're not closing any more locations and the incremental growth in the United States is finally able to come through in the financials because there's no sale, selling pressure on closing locations. And they went from uh, $1.6 billion of EBITDA to $3 billion, $3.1 billion in two years because they weren't, they had, they'd sold off all the UK locations and what this growth represents is purely the United States growing, which I believe is at a higher margin uh, business and, and their growing locations. The combination that is that exponential growth that we wanna see. Hey, sorry to interrupt. If you like the content, please subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. Also, if you want more stock tips, check my website out, cashflowinvestingpro.com, where I produce one pagers like this one, summarizing 10 years of financial information for America Express. I give you a forecast of what I think it's gonna do. And currently, I think it's yield 23% IRR for the next decade. An amazing stock pick. There's lots more. Check out the link below for a free one pager at cashflowinvestingpro.com. Okay, so that's a very, very long explanation of the history of revenue and EBITDA, but I think that's why here it's important to understand that revenue and EBITDA growth is weak, but checks the box uh, because now that you understand the nuance behind why revenue is flat, it's only flat because they were selling off portions of their business. In reality, there's a growing business model here that they're gearing up for. 
let's look at enterprise value. Enterprise value is the entire value of the business. My analogy is, is buying a home. If you buy a house in the open market, let's say you pay $1 million for a home, that is the enterprise value of that house. You then go to the bank and you borrow $800,000 to, to buy, the, buy the house and you put down, down payment of $200,000. The $200,000 is your equity. The $800,000 is your loan. The combined value is the value of the house, which is the enterprise value. A business is the same thing. Enterprise value is the entire value of the business. Less the debt leaves the equity. What trades on the stock market is only the equity. In my analogy, that would only be the 200 grand that you put down on the house. It ignores all the other debt that's out there. And that's very, very important, especially in this rising interest rate environment. You absolutely must pay attention to how much debt or leverage, as they call it, is on a business. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at short-term and long-term debt lease obligations, we're going to look at pensions, and we're going to look at any current portion of any of that. We're going to add it all up. We're going to see that they had 1.6, almost $1.7 billion of debt in 2014. That was really close to their earnings of 1.4. So almost one times debt to EBITDA, which is what we want to see. Now that has grown to $5.1 billion over this time frame, but so is earnings. Earnings have doubled to $3 billion. So they've got debt slightly less than two times. Debt has grown as a percentage of earnings, but so have earnings, and that's what we want to see. Excess cash, excess cash is cash that has been generated, sits in the balance sheet, has not been used to, been to pay off dividends, to buy back shares. It's basically cash that's in a savings account. It's not needed to run the business, and you want to subtract that from the enterprise value to make sure you're looking at a business that is a net of excess cash. Why? Well, think of this. If you had a business and someone wanted to buy it from you, uh, you would sell them the business, but you'd say, wait a second, I've got a savings account with a million dollars in it. It has nothing to do with the business. You don't need it. It's just money that I've been saving that I've earned in prior periods that I never took a distribution for. So you're going to say, let me distribute that to myself. Then I will sell you the business. That's exactly what you were doing here. You want to make sure you net uh, a free cash. So market cap, market cap is shares outstanding times price. This is the equity, the 200 grand of my home price analogy that actually trades in the stock market. So that's $14 billion was their market cap in 2014. It's grown to $27 billion over this time frame, basically following the same cadence that we had with earnings. Relatively flat, slight growth, and then, and then it spikes and grows much more quicker recently as earnings have grown. So enterprise value is basically, the, the, the gist here is that enterprise value has doubled over this period of time from $16 billion to $32 billion. Next thing we want to look at is a couple ratios. We want to look at a leverage ratio. We'll cover that really quickly. Net debt to EBITDA. This is how much debt do they have divided by how many earnings they make. How many years of operating is it going to take them to pay off their debt? And we want this to be less than three times. And look at this. Over this de decade period of time, it's always stayed less than three. Good job, CFO and accounting team, for being conservative on your balance sheet. I really, really appreciate that. Right now, they're at 1.5 times. On the Q1 presentation, we showed you they're at 1x. And in their forecast period, they're going to keep it to 1 to 1.5 times. I like that. That's great to see. The next thing we want to look at is enterprise value EBITDA. Now, this is a relative value metric that scales earnings, it scales the, um, the enterprise value, the entire value of the business, divide by earnings to figure out Basically, how many years of operations does this business have to generate to buy itself? It's a weird way to look at it, but that's a way of looking at how many years of cash flow you're paying for. And this business is about 11 times uh, free cash flow. Excuse me, 11 times EBITDA is what this range is. It, it can spike up as high as 15 when market gets a little crazy, but I don't see any single digits in here. It looks pretty defensible. Okay, let's get to the name of the game and look at free cash flow. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's my favorite statement. It's your favorite statement. It's the cash flow statement. Let's figure out how much jack these guys make. Now, adjusted cash flow from operations. What we're going to pull is the cash flow from operations line. It's the first third of the cash flow statement. Remember, operating, financing, excuse me, operating, investing, and financing are the three sections of the cash flow statement. And I've got those three laid out right here. 
adjusted cash flow from operations. I'm adjusting for stock-based comp. I expense it as though it were cash. And then two, this last period, I made some changes to inventory. Due to the pandemic, they sold through a lot of inventory and they had to replace it. So I'm gonna adjust for that because it's a one-time change in nature. But basically, you're gonna see a 10% annualized growth rate in free cash flow, which by the way, lines up very nicely with the 11% annual growth rate in the EBITDA. So the accounting team is expensing cash costs properly. Thank you, good job accounting team. And this means that free cash flow here, cash flow from operation is growing 10% every year on an annualized basis, excellent. CapEx. CapEx, this is not acquisition CapEx. This is the build out the, of new, new locations, this is the upgrade of existing locations. And they spend about $300 million every year with new paint, new data systems, new infrastructure, just making sure that their business is running properly. What I like to see here is the, the difference between free, uh, operating cash flow and CapEx. You want that, if you subtract the two, to be a large positive number. And here, they made roughly 16, roughly $1.6 billion in, in adjusted cash flow operations last year. They peeled off $300 million to put back in the business, and that left about $1.3 billion of pure cash that's available for debt and the equity holders. Now, what do we know about the debt? Well, the debt is very, very reasonable at 1.5 times. So while they made a payment, here, $575 million, they don't really need to. That is very manageable. If I zero that out, in fact, I'll zero out the last couple of years to give you an idea, free cash flow for the business for the last three years running is averaging $1.2 billion every single year. Now divide that by the number of shares outstanding of 219 million, which they are buying back shares, by the way, and I get roughly $5.75 of free cash flow every single year that this business generates. And that, my friends, that is what the business is truly based on. That's the value of why you buy stock. You buy stock because you want the free cash flow that that business generates. And what the, what the business job is to reinvest that, business, that free cash flow at a profitable and a high rate of return or dividend it out, distribute it back to the shareholders, and we will go buy a different stock that can do that with that free cash flow. That's the whole name of the game. And the stock market fluctuations up and down, blah, blah, blah. All that is, it's people betting and guessing on what this number is going to be next year. That's it. But the interesting thing is if you zoom out 10, 20, 30 years, all that noise goes away. And what you're left with is a very calm question of do you want a uh, plumbing and heating supply company with over a million customers, with 20,000 suppliers, that's global, and mostly in the United States, supplying parts to contractors to, and, to, and to businesses that's producing $5.75 per share every year, and it most likely will grow. Most likely. Nobody knows, but most likely. Now, what would you pay for that? If, you, if, if I said you could pay 10 times earnings for that or less, that it would pay off for itself in 10 years and you just let it continue clicking along and that every dollar after that it's paid for itself, that's a neat idea. That is what long-term investing is all about and it takes away the ambiguity of the bar talk of my stock went up and down who cares you're not selling anyways you're holding it for 25 years so what does it matter what the price is the idea is if you bought it at a great price you hang on to it practically forever the next thing i want to show you here is share count now we have a very interesting classification here of stock that I like to call a trifecta, hence the t-shirt that I'm wearing. What does it mean to be a trifecta? Well, a trifecta is three things. One, earnings growth. We've seen that. I just showed you that. Earnings growth are 10% per year, and now that they've sold off the European stuff that only focuses in the United States, that should continue to grow nicely. Number two, number two is market multiple expansion. We should get that in a second. I'll show you how you can buy the stock cheaply and sell it for a higher multiple. Number three, stock buyback. You want a stock, you want a company that's buying back its own shares. That means your ownership is growing as a percentage of ownership of this business without having to put another dollar in the business. Think of a pizza pie. If I cut the Pie in half, I have two share shareholders. If I cut it in quarters, I have four shareholders. What happens if I have four shareholders and I put it back together to where there's only one slice? I have two shareholders. My one quarter ownership doubled to be 
50% ownership and I did nothing to do it. That's essentially what stock buyback is in a very, very simplistic manner. What they're doing right now is they're buying back 2% of the business on average every single year and that compounds over decades and your ownership will grow very, very nicely. So just a trifecta is a stock that I have found that does all three, earnings growth, market multiple, expansion opportunity, and a share buyback. That gives you the hockey stick curve that you want in the stock price over a long period of time. Free cash flow, I'm just dividing free cash flow to equity by, uh, by share, gives me a per share basis. I get the stock price on average and I get a cash flow yield. We want stocks that are yielding, I don't know, north of five, six, eight, I mean, as high as possible, but reasonably so. I'll put back the debt. Let's take a look and let's forecast this business. If you're liking this channel, by the way, hit the subscribe button. Throw me a comment down below. It really helps the algorithm. I appreciate that. Okay, to forecast this business, I'm gonna break it down on a per unit basis. So behind me, I've got their uh, 1,700 locations. I have a, a revenue per location. They make about $16.6 .6 million per location, and they make about $1.8 million of EBITDA per location. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, going forward, they're gonna grow the United States. They have 1,500 locations. They're gonna grow that at 2.5% every single year. I'm gonna keep Canada flat at 211 because I don't know what they're gonna do there. And I'm not gonna move the price much on a per, per location basis. And I'm gonna say that locations, total locations, are gonna grow from 1,700 to about 2,100 uh, out 10 years from now. I'm gonna keep the price per, uh, the revenue, excuse me, the revenue per location is gonna grow over time from 16.6 .6 to 19. Revenue per location just helps with inflation a little bit. And I'm gonna keep earnings uh, roughly flat on a margin basis. I believe I used 11%. Yeah, EBITDA margin 11% over time. And what that does is it gives me an EBITDA forecast. So if we look at the EBITDA forecast, what I have behind me is a forecast of just shy of $3 billion for the year of 2023, their fiscal year, of which they've just started the very first quarter. Now that's, that's a down quarter of 5%. That gives me a little bit of cushion. They reported strong numbers in Q1, but, I, but we are going into a recession. I wanna be cognizant of that, and I don't wanna be out of the gate too much. This is where we get into the well-priced stock. I wanna build a forecast that is conservative enough that I feel comfortable buying into it. And then if that conservative forecast beats the market, that's what we're looking for. 5% growth, this is basically me adjusting onto my model of my store growth rate. And I'm gonna grow it at 5% over time. That's a combination of per unit growth and a little bit of inflation on a per unit value. I get 5% earnings growth to 4.5, 4.6 billion dollars in 2023, out 10 years from now. Now I'm gonna apply a 12 times market multiple to this which I think is fair for a business growing at 5% annual. Especially if I look historically, they've been around the 11 to 12, as high as 15. Their average over that time period is 12.2. So I'm sticking with the average of 12 times. Now, if I take 12 times this $4.5 billion, I get an enterprise value of $55, $55 billion. Less debt of 7 billion over time, they're gonna grow but keep that same leverage ratio. I get a market cap of just shy of $50 billion, of $47.8 billion. Divide by the shares, I'm saying I get a target price, target estimate, guess in the air, $218 for this stock out 10 years. Let's take a look at free cash flow. Free cash flow, I pick up a little bit of drop year over year, so I'm just shy of $5.50 next year as the earnings estimate for free cash flow. And that's gonna grow over time at the 5% rate to $8.36. I apply a yield to that of 4.2%, I get just shy of $200 per share based on a free cash flow method. Okay, here's the fun part. Now that we've looked at this stock in detail, we understand why earnings were flat over the last six or the last 10 years and have grown recently in the last two years. We understand how much we think the stock is gonna be worth on an EBITDA basis and a free cash flow basis, about 200 bucks a share. And I have those stock prices here, free cash flow, 200, and I've got the market, price, the market multiple method, 218, for an average of 208. Now is the time to look in the stock market, the public market, and figure and see what the price per share is. Don't look at the price before you analyze a stock. Analyze a stock first. Understand what you're willing to pay for this stock, then look 
at the market for the price. And when I look, I get $127 per share. I could buy as much stock as I want in Ferguson for $127 per share. And I think out over time, it's gonna be worth 208. Now, at that current price, if I make some calculations off the side, it's currently trading at $32 billion enterprise value. I get a forward EBITDA estimate with my price decline of five, excuse me, with my decline of 5%, even though Q1 2023 grew 11%. I'm saying $3 billion of EBITDA, that's at 11 times market multiple, but we're gonna sell it, we're gonna sell it out 10 years from now for 12 times. So if I take earnings and I go from 11 to 12, that is a market multiple expansion. It's a small one, but it's still expansion. Free cash flow, $5.49, and a free cash flow yield of 4.3. Now that is the last piece of a trifecta. If you can buy a stock for less than the market multiple, you're gonna sell it out in the future. That is the third piece or the middle piece, actually, in my t-shirt of the trifecta. So we've got earnings growth in this stock, we've got a market multiple expansion possibility, and you've got stock buybacks, which they've been doing historically and we expect them to continue. That's the, that's the trifecta. So what does this all mean? What does it do? If you put this in the stock price, what happens? So let's take a look. So if I take all this free cash flow, I pump it through my IRR calculation. I buy the stock at $127. I sell it in 10 years at $208. I get 11% annual return every single year over the next decade for owning a stock with a conservative growth forecast and one that is um, not, not leveraged, has, has low debt. That's an attractive market beating return for a stock that has a, a pretty, pretty attractive characteristics. Now, as the stock market is going a little nuts right now, I'm gonna give you a distribution that says, if you watch this video here, another, if you come back to this a, a couple of months from now and the stock has moved, what does it do to the IRR? Well, as the stock price goes up to $140, the IRR drops below 10%, I wouldn't be a buyer. But if the stock price falls below $127, $127 at a 114, 103, at 100 bucks a share, it's a 15% IRR stock, which is a which is a 50% better performance than the stock market. That's a big deal. Don't just write off 14% versus 11% here. That is a if if the S and P 500 does 10% on average in a year, and you're doing 14 or 15, you're doing 40 or 50% better than the market every single year. That's an important distinction. And those stocks that you can buy and hold for 30 years and make 100 times your money, that's basically in the 14% IRR range. So if you're looking for a 100 times stock, if you want something that might last, take a look at Ferguson. It's kind of an interesting stock. And if you hold it for 30 years, you can absolutely see something like that 100% return. Now this is Rational investing. I am a professional CFO. It's what I do for, for a living. And I have a YouTube channel and a blog that I just like to um, teach people how to value stocks. If you like this type of analysis and you want to learn how to do it for yourself, I teach a course, an investing course on my webpage, cashflowinvestingpro.com that I highly, highly recommend you take a look. There's a link to the description down below where I give you this Excel model and we go through the 10 Ks for Apple. I give you 10 years of data. I walk you through how to calculate revenue, EBITDA, how to calculate debt, um, what a share split is, what a reverse split is, how to build a forecast, what market multiples are and what they mean. I teach you the fundamentals that you need. It's basically an MBA and about three hours of lecture on how to value a stock. And it's, um, it's something that people that have taken, hundreds of people have bought this course that have taken it, uh, have given us glowing reviews and uh, it's gonna teach you things, fundamentals, that you do not get in school, and you're gonna carry that for the rest of your life. So I, I highly recommend the course. I'm, I'm really big on education, and I hope everybody um, learns how to better themselves by just being smarter with their money, and this is my little, little token out there to try to help people do that. The other thing, if you're interested in this type of stock picks, but don't want to do the research or don't have time to do the research yourself, please, please check out the Cash Flow Club. Now, the Cash Flow Club is a service I provide on the website, cashflowinvestingpro.com, whereby I produce one pagers. Now, what is a one pager? One pager takes this entire video of 30 minutes and summarizes it into a single page that you can lay on the side of your desk and every quarter, take a look at your top stocks. Say, oh, what's the price? Uh, it's a buy. I'll buy it now. This is, lets you 
take a look at over 200 stocks that we and the team of analysts at CashflowInvestingPro.com review all the time. Right now in the stock market, right now, there are amazing buys of companies that are returning, estimated to return 20, 25, 30% IRRs. That means these numbers are 20, per 20 times. Why? Because the stock market's down. Stock market is down hard and, and investors are throwing away wonderful companies that produce tremendous cash because they don't know what to buy. But if you're part of the cash flow club, we kick out uh, you know, 10 to 15 stocks every single month that we have reviewed and diligenced and we think are very interesting. And we give you 10 years of financial information on each one pager. We give you descriptions. We give you this sensitivity table. We give you forecasts of EBITDA and free cash flow. And we give you the information you need to, and shows the five key attributes right off to the side. And what I highly recommend is you join the club. It's a blog style. So you scroll through, you download the posts, you print them out, and you keep them off the side. And every quarter, you dust off and you look through, and you look through the stocks that you really love, the truly wonderful companies that you would love to own, but they're simply too expensive. Because I bet you that over time, if you watch that stock long enough, it will come into fashion and it will become cheap. Stocks cycle, they go up, they go down, it's normal. But if you buy the right co company that you can take advantage of that kind of cycling of the stock, if you're gonna hold something for 20, 30 years, you can wait for the right time to buy it. And that's how I use the club. I take the companies that I would love to own, I keep them on a stack, and over time, I just simply look at the one pager, and when it falls in the price range, then I think about buying it. So that's the pitch. You can download a free one pager at my website. There's a link down below. Check it out. Throw me a comment in the YouTube channel. I always love that. Hit the like, subscribe button. I really, really do appreciate it. This is uh, Cameron Stewart, Rational Investing. Like I said, um, uh, I really, really appreciate all the support. Uh, we're going to look at videos all next, uh, all next year, once a week. Throw me your suggestions. Love to have them. And I uh, hope you guys have a wonderful and safe New Year's, and I'll see you in 2023. Okay, uh, up's gonna pop right now a couple other stocks that I've reviewed in the past of other uh, deeply discounted stocks. Check those videos out as well if you like those. Thank you very much, bye-bye.